technically, I'm supposed to be talking about same-sex marriage, kind of what's next, and the difficulty for me is I don't have a crystal ball, I'm not good at predicting the future, and I certainly don't read tarot cards, so I don't know what's going to happen. I've got a lot of questions, but realistically what I'm hoping is that as I talk, you people will ask me questions. I'd much rather answer your questions than talk about anything I've got prepared, and frankly, I'm not positive that what I've got prepared will take me for an hour's worth of chatting. So, Please ask questions. Um, uh, my guess is that all of you know that the United States Supreme Court in June ruled in the Obergefell case what? that you can't hear me. Okay, well, let's figure out. Okay, well, I don't have a lot of control, so I'll do the best I can. Up is good. Okay. Anyway, the United States Supreme Court in June ruled in the Obergefell case that same-sex marriages are legal. And again, while I think you've probably all heard about that case, you probably don't know anything about Mr. Obergefell or that case. And that case involved two men who had gotten married in Maryland, and one partner was terminally ill. And in fact, in order to take advantage of the laws in Maryland at the time, they actually flew to Maryland, landed on the tarmac, they never got out of the plane, got married on the plane, and flew back to Ohio. And the issue in that case initially was whether the deceased death certificate would list the surviving spouse as a spouse or not. And the person died before any real rulings were issued, and the courts ruled that the state of Ohio had to put the spouse's name on the death certificate. That was what that case was about. And, you know, many people think, oh, the gay rights movement, you've got these, you know, wild radical folks out there doing all sorts of things to get attention to their case, and these are the people that are sponsored, you know, are resulting in these lawsuits. When the fact is that it really is everyday people with everyday kinds of problems or issues that really generate the cases that we hear about and eventually decide where we're going. And in fact, you may remember the last talk I had about this when I talked about E.B. Windsor. The first case in this kind of long trilogy of cases was the Windsor case, which was in, 19, or in 2013, when the Supreme Court said that the federal government had to treat marriages between same-sex couples as legitimate. The woman that was responsible for that case was E.D. Winter, who had been married with her partner since 2009, and they'd been together for over 20 years. They got married in Toronto. That case was a tax case, because E.D. Winter's partner had died, and the estate, the federal estate tax for her was going to be 630, some odd, some odd some ridiculous amount of tax money. It's actually, I'm sorry, it was $365,000. But anyway, in order to, if they had been, if the federal government had recognized her marriage, she would have had no inheritance tax. And so she sued and eventually won. But my point is, it's, it's not special people, it's not radical, you know, troublemakers that are responsible for these lawsuits. It's everyday folks. And again, if you remember when I was here the last time talking about these issues, I represented people in, in filing the very first lawsuit in Kansas to challenge same -sex, the bans against same-sex marriage. And then there was two men who live in um, Alma, and then two women who live here in town. And there's nothing extraordinary about them either. They're not radicals. They didn't really relish the idea that their names would be in the paper. They really tried to avoid some of the publicity that resulted from that. So the interesting thing to me is that the people who are responsible for a lot of this, the legal rights we have, are folk, everyday folks with no special you know, real agenda. They just want to live their lives and be treated as, as everyone else is treated. So the Supreme Court in, in June says same-sex couples could marry. What happened in Kansas? Well, at that point, 
There were three cases pending in the state of Kansas for same-sex marriage, or related to same-sex marriage. The first was the one I just mentioned that I filed that involved those two couples. That was a tax case. And in my case, the argument was essentially that the Kansas tax code required the state to use federal definitions for marriage, and the state was not abiding by its own statutes in forcing same-sex couples to file as single persons for tax purposes. That case languished for a while. I filed it in December of 2013, and Judge Tyson Topeka didn't, just kept putting us on hold. He said, I wanted, first he wanted to see what the, the Tenth Circuit Court of Appeals would say, and then he said, well, I want to see what the Supreme Court says, and then there was a case in Topeka and Kansas City that he said, well, I'm going to wait for that too. He just kept finding reasons to delay his ultimate decision. Once the Obergefell decision came down, Judge Tyson did rule, we had a hearing in July, and he ruled that the states, maybe I need to back up just a little bit, the, TAC, the Department of Revenue had instituted something called Notice 1318 that said essentially that same-sex couples who are legally married elsewhere have to file as single people in Kansas, and Judge Tyson ruled that based on the Obergefell decision, the state's constitutional amendment and statutes defining marriage were clearly unconstitutional and unconstitutional at their implementation. Therefore, the state's Notice 1318 was also void as a result because it was based on an unconstitutional law in the first place. So the bottom line is my clients win. The other two cases that were pending were, first, Derek Schmidt, the Attorney General from the state of Kansas, had filed a lawsuit right after Obergefell. There was massive confusion in Kansas about whether same-sex couples could get married or not, or not the Obergefell, the, um, I'm sorry, the Tenth Circuit decisions in 2014. The Tenth Circuit had ruled in cases from Oklahoma and Utah that basically said same-sex couples have the right to get married. It's because Kansas is in the Tenth Circuit. Arguably, the decision of the Tenth Circuit governs in Kansas. So there was a question, should people be able to get married in Kansas? And the state didn't really know how to handle that. Martha Kaufman from the, part, from the state's Office of Judicial Administration issued a notice to the judges in, in the state and the district court clerks in the state saying, essentially, you can't give any legal advice. Clerks of the court are not allowed to give legal advice. And if you deny people an application for marriage, you are essentially giving them legal advice. You're telling them they can't get married in Kansas. Again, remember this is before Obergefell. And so the clerks were kind of up in the air. And what Martha Coughlin said is rely on what your chief judge says. And in Johnson County, um, I forget the judge's name, but anyway, the judge in Johnson County said that marriages could go forward. They're okay. You know, he, he applied basically the decision of the Tenth Circuit and said we're going to allow marriages to go forward. And Derek Schmidt filed a lawsuit to stop that. That was in the Kansas Supreme Court. My clients filed an amicus brief in that case. And the Supreme Court, had, this took a while, but in the matter of a couple of weeks, the Supreme Court issued an edict basically saying that the marriages could go forward in Johnson County. At the same time, yeah. The Kansas Supreme Court? Yes, the Kansas Supreme Court. Um, at the same time, the ACLU in Kansas City filed a federal lawsuit in federal district court challenging the count Douglas and um, Sedgwick counties because the judges in those two counties said, no, we can't issue marriage licenses and we won't. And what happened then, and again, almost simultaneously with the way things were working in the Kansas Supreme Court, Judge Crabtree in the federal district court issued a temporary injunction and allowed marriages to go forward. At that point, we entered this bizarre period in Kansas where marriages could happen in some counties and not others. It depended on what happened in each county. The official state position was that there were only three counties that could issue marriage licenses, and those were Johnson, Douglas, and Sedgwick. And any other marriage licenses issued were not going to be honored. But in addition, 
the state's position was, even though we've issued those marriage licenses, anyone who married, any same-sex couple who gets married, doesn't get any of the rights of marriage. So for example, you know, if you, you, normally when you get married, you have the right to change your name. The state wasn't honoring any name changes. Um, the state wasn't allowing those couples who were legally married in the state of Kansas to file their taxes as married couples. It was, it's just a very bizarre thing to be going on. So, we've got this kind of weird situation, and in June of 2015, when the Supreme Court decided Obergefell, same-sex couples could get marriage licenses in 61 of the 105 counties of the state. So, it was just unsettled. So you would think, we have the Supreme Court, they issue a decision, they say, States can't prohibit same-sex couples from getting married, and the Supreme Court said, courts have to recognize marriages from other places. And it doesn't matter what the state laws say, and state constitutional claims or statutes are all invalid. You would like to think that that would resolve the issues, um, particularly in Kansas, but as you probably guess, they didn't. Um, what we have in Kansas right this minute is what I like to call marriage light for same-sex couples. Um, some of the issues have been resolved as best I know. For example, after, let me back up, after Obergefell, the state was still refusing to change names on driver's, driver's licenses or to accept any name changes for couples who've been married. There are also birth certificate issues that I'll get into in a minute. There, and the tax issues, my tax case had to be resolved first before the state would recognize people's ability to file taxes. So the ACLU, in their case that is still pending, of the three cases in Kansas, the ACLU case is still pending. Um, the ACLU amended their case to address these issues that the state is not recognizing marriages performed in its own state. And as a result of that action in federal court, a number of things have happened, and that's where the driver's license issue has now been resolved, I think. I haven't heard anyone complain since Judge Crabtree addressed this issue a couple of months ago. Um, the issue that I was directly involved in was a birth certificate issue. And, you know, again, you don't think about these things necessarily when you talk about marriage, but I represent a lesbian couple who got married in 2013. In 2014, one of the women in that couple went through artificial insemination to get pregnant so they could have a child. And that child was born the beginning of September of this year. And, you know, any opposite sex couple, whether they're married or not, when they go to the hospital and they you know, the pregnancy is a result of artificial insemination, when they go to the hospital and a child is born and they fill out the paperwork for a birth certificate, there is no question that the one part, you know, the male's name is put on the birth certificate as father and the woman's name is put on the birth certificate as mother. There's absolutely no question about anything at all. It just happens automatically. My clients, however, were told that they couldn't put their name, both names on the birth certificate. No, that wouldn't work. They could put the woman who got pregnant, they could put her name on the birth certificate. But if they didn't have a name for the father, that, that line would remain blank. Now, there is, I won't bore you with the statute citations, but there are all sorts of statutes in Kansas that say when a married couple has a child as a result of artificial insemination. Both parties are considered parents at law for that child, and both names should be placed on the birth certificate by the vital statistics folks. So, I've got a situation, I have a married couple, that, you know, who go through artificial insemination, produce a child, both names should go on the birth certificate. No, no, the vital statistics people said, no, no. No, if there's no father, we just leave that line blank. Um, and I think you again know probably where this headed. Very quickly, the ACLU also amended their lawsuit in Kansas City to add the birth certificate issues using my clients and, and an 
affidavit from me as well. And interestingly enough, Judge Crabtree hasn't technically ruled on that yet. But <coughs> since all of that happened, and it all happened, my lawsuit was filed at the beginning of the week, the ACU amended, I think, with seven days later or something. But it all happened relatively quickly. Surprise, surprise, the Department of Vital Statistics said, oh, we'll issue a birth certificate to your clients. I said, well, that's nice. What about everybody else? Oh, well, no, no, we'll, we'll just make a case-by-case -case decision. <laughs> now, so the newspapers reported all of that. And, you know, one day we've got, they're going to make a case-by-case -case decision, at which point the ACLU filed yet another uh, amendment to the pleading in Kansas City. And the next day, surprise, surprise, the state said, oh, never mind, we'll just issue them all. Now, the problem for me, and the reason I still call this marriage light, is that I've got the forms that the state is now using. And the Department of Vital Statistics, I mean, the attorneys I've dealt with there are, are very interesting. They're obviously extraordinarily conservative. But the forms now have, for parent one, it's, it just says mother. And for the other parent, it says father slash parent two. And that may sound like it makes some sense, and I understand the logic behind it, I guess. But I represent a lot of gay men who are married, who have children. Where's the spot for both men on that form? Um, it's an issue that is not resolved. I've got all sorts of questions about it. And you know, one of the, when I do CLEs a lot, I like to look at it, people and say, you know, so where do children come from? And you know, it, it's, it seems like an odd question, perhaps, but when you're talking about my clients, it's not such an odd question because it's a difficult dilemma. Yeah. Okay, the um, opposite sense, a couple have a child yes. where they've had a surrogate parent. Yes. Who is listed as mother? Good question. Yeah. Okay. And well, okay, I'm sorry. The question was, if an opposite sex couple use a surrogate, who is listed on the birth certificate as parents for the child? And the answer in Kansas is, there is no legal guidance one way or the other, okay? The difficulty in Kansas is that the last time all of the reproductive, all the laws about artificial reproductive technology were last, last substantially amended in 1968. Now, you all know how medical science has advanced since 1968, particularly in the area of childbirth, and, you know, all, all the various, I mean, the idea of egg harvesting and and all sorts of things in 1968 was kind of a fantasy for a few medical researchers, but certainly not a reality. You wouldn't be reading stories about, you know, women who donate their eggs getting paid, or should they be paid, or how much should they be paid, which is a big legal issue in certain circles right this minute. But in Kansas, we have no laws whatsoever. We have a law that talks about artificial insemination. It talks about when the husband consents and the wife uses artificial insemination through a licensed medical professional, I think the statute may even say doctor, then the child is presumed to be a child of that marriage and both parents are legally parents. But any other option that might exist out there is not covered under Kansas law. And it's one of the things I think as we talk about what's next, I think this is an area that has got to be addressed I do know for a fact that the, since, since my lawsuit and some discussions with the folks at the Vibe, I know they are working on modifying something, which actually, given their reluctance to do anything that I see as proper, terrifies me because I'm sure any proposals they come up with will be extraordinarily restrictive when I think we ought to recognize parental rights. Your situation about the surrogate Right this minute, what is done in most jurisdictions is that once the child is born, the parents who have arranged for the surrogacy adopt the child and both their names are placed on the birth certificate. Yeah. What if it was the husband's sperm? Well, I mean, it's, 
we are an area of law that is not well defined. Uh, and, and you know, it, it is it is truly kind of the forefront of where we're going to go as we start talking about what's necessary. But I think if you imagine these kinds of scenarios and you consider how old the law is in Kansas, you recognize there are serious issues that should be addressed. And when we start addressing those things, there are going to be a whole wide range of of philosophies that come into battle about what is, you know, when you have a surrogacy, should the woman who carries the child have any parental rights or not? Well, if you go back, go back to the hiring of the of the surrogate, and you know, can you pay that person? Can you know what what parental rights does that person have to the child that's produced? You know, does. The complications are enormous and the answers are hard to come by, but you know, the idea of law in my mind is to provide guidance about what should happen and how to protect people's various rights. And in the absence of law, which you've got to be kind of free for all, where everybody does whatever they please, and you don't know what's going on, it's very difficult to protect the parties involved when there's no guidance. And there are no case law, there's no case law in Kansas on any of these questions either. So it makes practitioners like me who deal with clients who are going through these various procedures extraordinarily difficult. There is a model act that's proposed that in the legal circles that these panels are created model acts that states adopt. And, and there is a model act for this kind of thing. Maine just, just adopted an extensive revision of their parentage laws and, and various things that is used as a model by some folks. Um, but it's a discussion that clearly is going to need to happen in Kansas. And from my perspective, in order to protect my clients, I, I think we need to be proactive about it in order to prevent the folks with vital statistics. Um, the um, case that you just had with the two women, where they allowed that, did that actually become a real case, or did they just sort of throw it aside so it's not even the case? OK, the question is, in my case, the case with my two clients, with you know what happened with that, it was an actual case. When the child was born, and this hospital told my clients that they couldn't put their names on the birth certificate, I filed a parentage action in Douglas County District Court, and I got an order that specifically said the state had to put my both my clients' names on the original birth certificate, and that was what the state formally objected to. They said they would not do it. So I had to file an amended pleading, basically said I wanted to make the state a party, and said I set a hearing on that for November 6th um, to argue and say, Judge, you know, they've got to do what you ordered them to do. And they, they caved, I mean, they caved a week and a half ago, so we've canceled that hearing. But yeah, we've got a court order so that now says we have there's a case a, that says yeah. What but you do. The, the case is not specifically helpful to other couples because it's a parentage action asking the court essentially to find the non-birth mother a mother and to order the state to issue the birth certificate. Um, since it only involves my clients, it's helpful in some respects as a precedent for other folks, but it certainly doesn't govern what the state has to do. And I think that's one of the reasons. They caved and agreed that my client should get their birth certificate because they didn't want to go to court and start arguing about what the state has to do in all cases. I had the same issue in the tax case. And the truth is, Judge Crabtree has done the same kinds of things in the, in the federal lawsuit. In my case, the tax case, I said I won. Well, I did. The, the judge ruled it, it was a declaratory judgment action. A declaratory judgment action, you basically say, Judge, please tell us what the law is. And Judge Tice did. He told us what the law was. He said the state has to treat same-sex married couples equally with every other married couple and that they should have the right to file their taxes jointly. But he refused to issue any injunctions ordering that the state do anything. He said, we'll just wait and see what happens. And if they continue to violate, come back and I'll issue an injunction then. Judge Crabtree has done the same thing. He has issued declaratory judgments all along the way saying, essentially, this is what the law is, but he has refused to issue injunctions ordering the state to, for example, put both names on a driver's, or change names on a driver's license, or put both names on a birth certificate. 
he too has said, well, the, the Obergefell decision is clear, and I think the state will in good faith follow the law. Um, and that's why that case is still pending, because the ACLU is saying, hey, judge, they're not following the law. They don't have any intention of following the law, and they're going to find every way they can to skirt around these issues. And that's why that's still pending. And how he'll rule on a request for an injunction is, is kind of difficult to predict. But the bottom line is that the state is kicking and screaming, but they're changing how they do things. Um, but my concern is that as we move forward and other issues come up, the state's still kicking and screaming and they're doing everything in a very begrudging kind of manner. They're not going to voluntarily do the right thing, which is troubling for you know, as a taxpayer that really annoys me. They've spent a fortune in legal fees fighting what is very clearly a losing battle. Why is the state, you know, when our state is in such desperate financial condition, why is it wasting money on lawsuits it knows it's going to lose? Um, it makes no sense to me. But th that's kind of where we're at. Um, I think. Who's getting those millions that we're spending on lawsuits? Oh, lawyers. Not me. I'm working mostly pro bono, but, but look, and lawyers for the state. Yeah, I'm, they are hiring outside counsel. And they're not paying Kansas tax. That's right, because they're a business. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, it's as ridiculous as it sounds. I don't pay any, ta any state tax. It's the most bizarre thing I've ever heard. Oh, that's right. I'm sorry? No, that's right. I just thought of it. Yeah. Aren't there something like, oh, 1,100 different tax laws that bear benefit married couples? So, is there a possibility? 1100 plus. Okay, well, the number you're referring to is not specifically a tax law. Okay. In, in, in the federal tax, in the federal, code. yeah, federal code, but uh, there are, I think the actual number in the federal level is 1,362 or something. I don't know. I want, I want to be, no, it's okay. No. In Kansas, it may be close to 1,100. But the, what we're talking about are laws in which the law talks about married people or husbands or wives or imposes duties or obligations on spouses. And those, things, those, those laws cover a variety of all sorts of things. Some, some of them are extraordinarily minor. For example, in Kansas, if you go to the department, you know, if you go down to the treasurer's office, you can register your spouse's car, even though your name may not be on the title, as long as you're married register the spouse's car. Not a big deal, right? But it also uncovers, you know, inheritance rights. If your spouse should die, you know, do you inherit from them or not? Or if the spouse wrote you out of the will, are you protected or not? And those kinds of laws are critically important. And as we talk about same-sex marriage and, this, and the marriage light issues, there are all, a whole variety of questions that are unresolved as a result of the Obergefell decision. And in Kansas in particular, these are really problematic. And they relate to when were you married? How long have you been married? And again, you may think, oh, that ought to be a simple, easy question to answer. But I'm, doing, I'm in the middle of a divorce now. My clients first got married back in 2006, but they lived in Kansas. They knew they couldn't legally get married, but they went to their church and their, you know, they went through a, a wedding ceremony. I've got the certificate from the church that says they were married in this church. Now that church is in Kansas. They didn't get a marriage license because Kansas wouldn't issue a marriage license at the time because at that time, 2006, year after our state constitutional amendment was passed saying same-sex couples couldn't get married, they couldn't legally get married. The Supreme Court has now said, through Oberfeld, that that constitutional amendment is void. So, now, to further complicate things, my client clients then later got married in another state where marriage was legal, but again, before the Oberfeld decision. So, as I argue about when were they married, you might be thinking, well, what difference does it make when they got married? They're getting a divorce. 
Well, that's true, I guess, except when you start talking about dividing marital property, how long people have been married is an important aspect of that because the court divides marital property that was accumulated during the course of the marriage. So it's really important for my client to determine were they married in 2006, were they married in 2009, or was the marriage only valid in June of 2015 when the Oberfeld decision came down? Yeah. How, how about common law marriages in the state? Uh, excellent question. And we need any seconds. And, and, well, and that's essentially what I'm going to have to argue in my case because I want to argue my clients are married. My clients, my client. You know, obviously the other side is going to argue something different, but I'm going to argue that. This is a common law state, and my client was common law married in 2006 when they went through the wedding ceremony in that church. Um, and the constitutional ban that was in effect then was unconstitutional. And therefore, the court should say she was married in 2006. I haven't fought that battle yet. I don't know how it's going to come out. But, you know, it has more to do, you know, you think about it. These issues get more complicated the more you think about them. You know, well, let's talk about inheritance rights. We have a couple that gets married and the state doesn't recognize the marriage and somebody, you know, when someone dies, does, is it, is it a spouse who inherits? Or does, you know, the, the difficulties are, are just enormous as you start plotting these things out. What about kids, you know, when they have kids? How does that affect various rights and things? The issues, the issues are just too complicated to kind of outline in a brief way, and we're only going to determine some of these issues as problems arise. But one of the ones that everyone in this room probably recognizes, what about Social Security benefits? Now, prior to Obergefell, we were advising all of our clients who were eligible for Social Security benefits to apply immediately. Now the difficulty for Social Security and for Kansas folks, particularly after the Windsor decision, is the Windsor decision said, and this was 2013, it said that the federal government had to treat mar all marriages between you know, anybody as long as they were legally performed. And that was great, that's a good decision, but there, the the problem is that federal agencies are not all governed by the same laws. The IRS, for example, treats marriage, treats ma as, when answering the question of is a couple married, the IRS relies on was the marriage valid where it was performed. So that if a couple married in Iowa and moved to Kansas, when they filed their federal income taxes after the Windsor decision, they had to file their taxes as a married couple. Whereas in Kansas, they had to file separately, which created a whole complex problem, which is why I filed my lawsuit. But the federal government, for tax purposes, they're married. But Social Security is governed by a specific statute that says the Social Security Administration has to consider whether they're married or not based on the, the law of the state in which they reside. So that couple that got married in Iowa and moved back to Kansas, they're not married under Social Security law. Mm -hmm. And so after Obergefell, yes, they're married. Social Security can treat them as married. But for Social Security benefits, when were they married? It's, it's the same question. Were they married, you know, if we use my divorce client, was she married in 2006 or 2009 or when the Oberfeld decision came down? And those have drastic consequences when you talk about Social Security benefits. You know, were they married for the 10-year period required under certain sections? Were they required, were they married for the nine months required under other sections? And it makes it a nightmare. Now, the good news from my perspective is nightmares for lawyers are great. You know why? We charge a lot of money. <laughs> um, but it's not right we should be going through these battles. I mean, it, it's just, it, 
these things shouldn't be happening. It should be fairly clear cut. And people shouldn't be forced to pay attorney's fees to figure out, do I inherit from my spouse or not? Do I qualify for Social Security or not? You know, these things are still unresolved, and it's going to take legal battles um, to get some of those answers. Had a group of attorneys submitted um, laws that would correct these things to our representatives for um, the answer is yes, and on multiple levels. The question was, have, have proposals been made to legislators about changes that are necessary in the law? And, and those proposals have been made both on the state and the federal level at very, in various ways. Um, the difficulty is that getting these things passed is almost impossible. I mean, we've got a Congress that's inactive and ineffective. I mean, they can't agree on what time of day it is these you know, the Republicans can't even pick a speaker. I mean, it's just, it's absurd. Um, and in all honesty, and no offense, boo, but the situation's not much better in Kansas. Um, in fact, the conservatives in Kansas kind of steamroll through a whole bunch of stuff they know is, there's no possible way to be held con you know, constitutional, but they're gonna do it anyway. Um, and so the dilemma is we can make these proposals, and you know, there's, there's a lot of debate. You know, for example, if we talk about the artificial reproductive technology questions, do we propose changes in the legislature when we know it's ultimately extraordinarily conservative and they're going to pass something really stupid? Or do we just leave it the way it is with no laws in place where nobody knows what they should do? You know, which is better, the really stupid law you have to fight or the no law situation where you still have to do battle, and it's it's kind of you know, but we, you know some people argue well with no law at least you can do what you want. Nobody can say you were in violation of the law. Well, that's that's a legitimate argument, uh, but it creates all sorts of uncertainty, and I don't think the law doesn't necessarily like uncertainty either. But there aren't simple answers to this. But there are lots of groups nationally and and in Kansas that are working to change the laws to benefit LGBTQ folks. It's just, it's a really tough road to hoe when you've got a conservative legislature that is so reactionary. Uh, and I'm not sure we're gonna see a quick resolution of that particular problem. Um, I think another area, you know, I've, I keep saying LGBTQ, and for those who don't, it's, um, L is lesbian, G is gay, B is bi, T is transgender, and um, Q is questioning usually. It kind of depends on your audience. The Q part is an interesting kind of linguistic thing for you to think about. When I was a child, and for people of my age and older basically, Q meant, I mean basically you talk about queers, and it was, you know, it's just as bad as the N-word to a certain generation of folks. But to young people, they proudly identify as being queer, and it's, so it's an interesting word in terms of its usage, and so depending on to whom you are speaking, how that, the Q part is. And then there are lots of other initials added on in various ways for, for various folks. But in that kind of quad of folks, that. You know, we, I've talked about laws that generally govern lesbians and gays, but you know, bisexual folks are sort of out, there, there isn't anything, they don't fit in any kind of legal categories and the laws governing their, their lives are sometimes extraordinarily contradictory. Um, the, I think one of the forefronts we're going to see as we move forward, kind of talking about the what's next area, is the issue of transgender rights and transgender I mean, just how transgender people are addressed legally and the battles they're going through. Um, again, this is an area that I shudder to think about what the Kansas legislature might do. But um, these battles are coming up all the time. And um, we're dealing with sociological issues that people are adjusting to. And you know, attitudinal changes and recognition of a variety of things that people have never even thought about before. You know, if you concept of you know a five-year-old saying I'm not a boy I'm a girl I'm going through you know and parents will 
allowing a child to transition and you know is the parent doing the right thing or the wrong thing there are lots of cases where parents have been accused of child abuse because they've allowed a child to transition from male to female or female to male while you know as a child um, and then there are other cases where parents are accused of the child abuse because they haven't allowed the child to transition. We are on the forefront of very, very rapidly changing laws, and there is no way to underestimate the rapidity of, of how these things are changing. It's just mind-boggling. I'm an adjunct professor at the law school, and I teach at an LGBTQ legal seminar. And one of the things I talk about with my students is, you know, and I show them videos from the 1960s, you know, there used to be public public service announcements on TV, you know, telling, warning parents of the hazards of letting their kids be out in public when homosexuals might prey on them and recruit them. Um, it, to those of you who've lived through that, you remember, and it doesn't seem quite so silly to my students. They just they just can't imagine. It's just it's like it's like some phony movie, it's a satire. They don't get it. They don't get the idea that anybody would think that being gay was a problem in any way, shape, or form. They've grown up with it. It's on their every television show they watch has at least one to one or two gay people. And you know, now transgender folks are in, on multiple shows. So it's a cultural norm now that didn't exist when we were children. And the shift is just but just the way the law has changed for marriage, you know, from 2005 when the majority of the states passed amendments saying that same-sex couples couldn't marry, to the Obergefell decision is, you know, 10 years. We've gone from no to of course. Um, that's, a, that's a remarkably dramatic shift in public policy and attitude. and. and Thing, people and things are still catching up. You know, we still have, you know, a clerk in Kentucky saying, I don't have to issue marriage licenses and I'm going to get national attention as a result. Um, you know, the George Wallace approach. Um, but we're going to have those same issues in Kansas as well. But this, I'm, I will be astonished if in this session of the legislature we don't see bills about religious freedoms and religious expression and who knows what they'll call the bills. But essentially what they're going to say is we want the right to deny you know, services or you know, treat same-sex couples inequitably. I mean, that is that is the purpose of those laws. There is no other explanation for that. And um, to date, the legislature has been successful in defeating most of those proposals. But I'm not sure that's going to continue. It's, it's, it's hard to predict. <laughs> but seriously, I think that's going to, you know, we've got the transgender issues that are going to clearly come up in, in all sorts of ways. Um, interestingly enough, often in, in school and the school board policy kinds of ways because the number of children now who are identifying as a gender other than the one that they were supported at birth is becoming more and more problematic. Schools don't know how to deal with it. Offices don't know how to deal with it. Businesses don't know how to deal with it. We're developing all sorts of new norms that are going to have to evolve. I mean, that's, that's the only way. But then we're going to have to deal with the religious freedom issues. Um, otherwise, you know, otherwise, otherwise, it's not much, you know. Uh, <laughs> that, that, oh, of course, and the parenting stuff. I mean, all those parenting issues are going to be monstrous. And the ramifications of not being able to determine when people were married or how long they've been married. It's just, it's just going to create all sorts of weird issues. Yes? Uh, it sounds as though it's a class problem, too. Uh, you know, a lot of people cannot afford lawyers, even when you do it for a while now. Is there uh, a group of legal aid people who are trained? Or, well, uh, are, in some the, communities, yes, actually, there are the equivalent of legal aid. And, you know, the ACLU has been at the forefront of handling these cases. There's something called the National Coalition of Lesbian Rights that's been on the forefront of many of the parenting issues I'm talking about. There is um, Lambda Legal, who performs many of those same services. 
I'm, I'm a member of something called an LGBT Family Law Institute, which is a collection of attorneys across the country who work on these issues and we change, exchange ideas and you know, suggestions for how to deal with these things. Some law schools, not many, but some have law, law clinics where the students are just working on LGBT um, issues. Um, so yeah, there are some resources out there. I mean, when I filed the, the lawsuit for the two women over the birth certificate issue, Lambda Legal offered to help us, but as it turned out, since the state came, we didn't need their assistance. But it was nice to know they'd be there. Um, and you know, I always tell people, you know, if you're familiar with these organizations and you care about these issues, by all means, contribute money because they depend on, on public donations. Um, none of them are flush with cash. Uh, good question. And generally speaking, the interesting thing about it, I think to some extent it is a class issue. Um, and in some respects, it, I hesitate to make generalizations because everything is so different, but transgender folks have, have many of those issues and if they're impoverished, their life is, they don't have the resources to do all sorts of things. And so their lives are particularly difficult to put it simply. But um, if they have resources, you know, if they're the you know the genders of the world that can afford you know all the surgeries necessary, all those luxuries, and all the, the attorneys to do their battles, then they're going to come out much better. But for the everyday kind of person, I mean, if you go through sexual reassignment surgery in this country. Talking about several hundred thousand dollars. Now, most folks do not do it in this country, but go elsewhere. Where it's still it's still phenomenally expensive for those those procedures alone. And if you add legal battles on top of it, folks don't want to do that. In Kansas, talking about the transgender issues, we still have trouble. I mean, Kansas theoretically has an administrative regulation on the books that says that the Department of Vital Statistics should change gender markers on birth certificates if the person can prove that there's basically been a change and, and a reason to change the marker on the birth certificate. But the state will not do that. Um, they rely on an old case from the 90s in which um, the court held that essentially you are the gender you, you were declared when the doctor held you up in the, you know, right after your birth and said, ah, that's, you know. Um, and there's no possible way that that doctor could ever be wrong or that anything should be changed. That case is a horrible case. Um, and I won't talk about it a whole lot, but it's a bad case. It's bad case law. And unfortunately used to deny transgender folks a whole bunch of rights and many things that they would get if their, their true identities were recognized by the state. But the, so the state wants to change the birth marker on their um, birth certificate. Sometimes, we call this you know, kind of a roulette of sorts, sometimes the transgender folks can get the, the gender marker changed on their driver's license. It depends on the clerk at the motor vehicles when you go to get your new license. <laughs> Seriously, I mean, if you go through the formal process with the state, they deny the request. If you go up to the counter and you say, look, you know, my, I've changed my name. And you have a, the name change from, you know, Joe to Mary. And you know, my name is now legally Mary. I want to change my book. It depends entirely on, you know, it's just a matter of hitting a key on the computer. It's not complicated. Um, but some people will say, oh, yeah, sure, no problem. And they don't care. And other people will say, what are you, crazy? No, no, I can't do that. I can't do that. And nothing gets changed. And again, you think, well, what you know, what difference does it make? It makes a huge difference. Let's say you know, it's Friday night. You're coming home from work. You're tired and whatever, and you get pulled over by the cop, and you're now married, but your name, your, your driver's license says you're Joe. How long do you think it's going to take before you get home? <laughs> um, so these are really important things for our clients. And there aren't easy answers. There just aren't easy answers. And that's that's part of the problem that we face. Does age have anything to do with it? I mean, you have to be a certain age. No, not really. Um, 
for changing the birth markers, at least in theory, um, a child can do it with the parent cooperating, or an adult can have it done. You know, again, in theory, proper, by presenting the appropriate papers the, from the vital statistics folks. See, the trouble with the administrative regulation says that they may make the change. So it gives the discretion to the vital statistics folks to make that or not make it. And the state is simply refusing to do it. So, but age has not age in itself is not a factor. Yeah, you had a question. Oh, you had a question. Yeah. This is an example that has nothing to do with marriage. Okay. Okay, but it does have to do with the right to live of people who are gay. Uh huh. Okay. A very famous person that you made, was one of the greatest mathematicians of all time, and also equally regarding as a few now. Alan Turing. Yes. Was instrumental in breaking the German code during World War II. And 60 years ago, he was chemically castrated for being gay. And ultimately, such a committed suicide. Committed suicide, yeah. So that's a more fundamental to all of this discussion. Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, oh, we're talking about freedoms on a multiple level. We should be free to live our lives the way we want to live them. We should be free to love whomever we choose to love. Yeah. And we should be free to, to raise children if that's what we want to do. You know, assuming we're raising them, you know, we're not the last. That's a fundamental example that I can think of. Yeah, I don't know. behind all of this and how far we've come in the last 60 years. Oh, yeah. yeah we've, we've come very far. It's no question about that. Any other questions? Right thing to do, but convincing some legislators that 